Okay, settle in. We're gonna try to make this as quick and smooth as possible. This is your drift car. Number one, Thunderfire Speed, Charisma Super Speed, Ultra Modern Champion, Century Chariot, Super Fine Century Chariots. Charisma, have the call. Really? Yep, that's what it says. Okay, uh, this is your drift car. This is your drift car on uh, drift. <laughs> You'll see it slides exactly sideways. Uh, that's because this car has a matched grip in the front and the rear. We've got plastic tires all around. Your car has a floating pivot point. What the hell is a floating pivot point? It's the area where the car pivots when it initiates into drifts or makes changes or directional adjustments. This pivot point floats around inside of this box. This box is what's called a dynamic pivot point box. That box is defined by the setup of your car, but there are two different types of grip. The static grip is the front tire grip relative to the rear tire grip, and the front tire weight relative to the rear tire weight. The tire on your car is exactly the same as, well, this balloon. It's actually identical. The two work the same. They're made of rubber and they're filled with air. And if you push them onto the ground, they grip or move with the ground. You can see that we have some movement there. Let's talk about what's called the contact patch. The contact patch is where your tire is touching the ground. Your tire deforms. It flexes or adjusts to the shape of the ground. And so that contact patch is going to change your flex. The where the tire touches the ground is the contact patch, but what's interesting is the size of the contact patch equals the amount of grip. Now, we can simplify grip down to one basic concept. Weight equals grip. The heavier you put onto that tire, the more that tire deforms and the more it touches the ground. The more surface area touching the ground, well, the more grip it has. The less weight you place on it, well, the less grip it has. So we want to put the weight on the tire. And the weight on the tire, or this contact patch, is our control of drifting often. Is where we place the weight, it will naturally place the grip. Let's talk about static grip. Static grip is the grip that we're gonna base the dynamic grip on. Dynamic means that the weight of the car is moving around, it's changing the pressure on each tire. And just like our balloon example, you'll know that the tire with the most weight is gonna have the most grip. But dy dynamic is a little bit different than static. Static is our basis in which we base dynamic on. This is settled by two factors. The natural grip of the tires. We know this car particularly has the same grip, both front and rear, because it has the same tires front and rear, the same compound, and the same amount of air inside of them. The other thing that's gonna affect the static grip is the static weight balance of the car. Meaning, when the car's at rest, how much weight it has on the front and how much it has on the rear. This car has about the same front and rear weight and about the same front and rear tires. So if we push directly on the side of the car, it should just move in a straight line. And check it out, the car continues sliding through a drift without coming back or without spinning out more. That pivot point stays exactly the same in the center. But let's test static grip a little bit by imbalancing it on purpose. In this particular example, I've put, uh, I've changed the static grip of the tires. The rears are still the hard plastic original tires, but we've added a little bit more grip with some rubber bands to the front. This should affect the pivot point, and I theorize that it should bring the pivot point closer to the front. The front now has more static grip. We'll watch, and I'll put the pressure on the car in the same position as last time. Check it out, the car spins out. If it were in a drift and it had more front grip, the car would naturally want to spin out most of the time. The pivot point has now moved to the front of the car. The pivot point is defined by where the grip is. Let's see if this is continually true. 
So I've taken the front bands off and moved them to the rear tires. You'll see our front tires are now back to being hard plastic. Our rears have the uh, lovely rubberized bands on them. We should find that the pivot point moves to the rear. You've been watching the video long enough now that you know the rear has more static grip. Let's give it a push and let's find out if that's true. Cool. We can see the car pivoted at the back corner. That means that our pivot point is relative to the static tire grip. Our static tire grip can change and so that pivot point can move. That static part though is static. If I build a car with bigger rear tires than, than front tires, well naturally that grip will always be closer to the rear. So that static part doesn't change or adjust. It is non-dynamic. But let's talk about weight. So what's the other part of the static grip, well, it's the weight. It's how much weight a tire has. We've reverted our tires back to all plastic stock wheels again. Uh, no rubber bands on these either, either way. So the grip at this point is balanced again. If we push on the center of the car, you'll see it moves sideways. So let's adjust the weight this time. We'll put a little bit of extra weight on the front of the car. Now we know the front tires have more weight on them because we have our measuring tape on there. So they should have more grip. Let's see if that's true. Let's see if that affects our pivot point to the front. And you'll see weight has a huge factor on it. Let's try it for the rear then. Let's see if this is consistent. We're gonna take our weight and put it on the rear now. And so the rear should have more, more weight on it. Therefore it should have more grip and the pivot point should move to the rear. Look at that, it's consistent. So we know that the static grip is affected both by the natural grip of the tire and the natural balance of weight. So the front to rear grip balance of the tires and the front to rear weight balance of the car. Those two things affect our static grip. So let's chat about dynamic grip. Dynamic means that the car is in motion. It's no longer in a still frame or a single moment, but rather time is passing. Uh, the car can move, it floats on suspension, it can uh, lean forwards, lean back, lean left, lean right, uh, can, it can rise or lower as it goes over bumps. This means that the grip moves with the weight of the car as the weight moves more on one wheel and less on others. The pivot point moves with that grip. If the front right has more weight, well, the pivot point's closer to the front right. If the rear left has more weight, the pivot point's closer to the rear left. So wherever that weight moves, the pivot point moves to there. We saw earlier in a couple different diagrams the differences between the parts that made uh, our static choices for our floating pivot point and our dynamic ones. A couple of those uh, we'll start with here, the springs and the shocks. Here we have a spring. The spring's job is to hold the weight of the car in the air. It's to lift the car off the ground and, and support that weight. Sometimes you can get stiffer or softer springs, but those hold different amounts of weight. The problem with the spring is that it has a resonance or a frequency to it. When you compress it and let it go suddenly, it sort of vibrates. And that's a problem because that means the car is going to vibrate. So to control that, we have the shock. The shock's job is to control the speed of the spring. And it can do that in two ways. It can control how fast the spring compresses and how fast the spring expands. Often you'll hear this is called uh, bound and rebound or bump and rebound. There's a couple other different terms that are used in different areas of the world, but basically it's the same thing. Control the speed of the spring. Okay, so we know cars have a spring and a shock on each corner of the car. Uh, what's interesting is usually the front springs are stiffer. That means that usually the engine's in the front, so there's more front weight, so there needs to be stiffer springs to hold that front weight up. But also cars slow down faster than they accelerate, so that also means that there's going to be more force on that front end. So generally they have stiffer front springs. So to keep things simple, we're just going to focus on the springs and how they affect our floating pivot point. Uh, and the box that retains or contains that floating pivot point. Our pivot point bounding box is defined by where the weight can move to. The stiffer the spring, the less weight can move to that particular wheel, the less grip we have at that wheel. 
the less grip we have at that wheel, the less likely it is to be where the car pivots around. Our spring rates will determine the shape of our dynamic pivot point box. Okay, you've made it this far. Let's get right to the meat and the core, the secret of this whole video, which is sway bars. The sway bar is an amazingly simple mechanical device. It's a U-shaped piece of metal that's bolted to the chassis via a pivot point along the front edge of the bar. This leaves two exposed ends. These are called blades, one on the right side of the car, one on the left. As your car goes through a turn, the car is going to lean over to one side. This compresses one side of the suspension and decompresses the other side of the suspension. These blades are attached to each side of the car. As one spring compresses, it lifts up on one side of the sway bar. Since the sway bar is one piece, that force is transferred to the other side, the other spring of the car, and it's currently decompressing, so it's going to push back against that sway bar. What's exciting about this is it temporarily increases the spring rate of the spring that's being compressed, resisting the car leaning over more. So the cool thing is we know that changing our spring rates front and rear will change where the box kind of moves forwards and backwards, also a little bit left and right. But now we can tune left and right basically separately as well, and we can cause that, that bounding box for our pivot point to taper, uh, meaning the car will lean more in the back or lean more in the front during, during a drift as well. So this rewards us with a pretty good opportunity to tune the pitch and the roll separately. Pitch being the car leaning forwards or backwards, and roll meaning the car moves left and right. And we get a greater variety of tuning options here. Drifting has four parts. It has the setup of the corner, it has the initiation, the control point, and the exit. What we can do is we can use the sway bar actually to our advantage to make drifting easier. Uh, by avoiding putting on really stiff springs in the front, we can still allow the weight to transfer to the front wheels to make initiations easier and smoother. But once the car begins to lean into the drifter, once it begins to roll, because of the stiff front sway bar, it then naturally pulls the weight to the back tires, making the control point easier as well. We now can drift with more throttle and drift at a faster speed, but also a higher angle and be able to recover that angle because of the shape of our bounding box. Some of you may be struggling at the end of this video. Uh, describing this or putting this into words and visuals is sometimes difficult. And so um, we'll do a final overly simplified version. And yes, this is overly simplified. So if you're like, Quinn, the math isn't perfect. The math isn't perfect. We're just oversimplifying on purpose. Um, your car has four wheels, and that means it has 100% grip. If we divide 100 by uh, four, well, that's 25. It's 25% of the grip on each wheel. So when you go to initiate, you'll have at least 50% grip on the front. But once the car leans over, because we have a stiffer front sway bar and generally slightly stiffer front springs, um, that the car will roll more at the rear. This causes one of the front wheels to actually lift off the ground. The trailing wheel is going to come off the ground. That changes our math. It takes our 100% now and divides it by th by three instead of by four. So we have one front wheel with 33% of the weight and we have two rear wheels, each with 33%, resulting in the rear having 66% of the weight or the 66% of the grip on the car. And that automatically forces the rear to have more traction. So regardless of how big of an angle you come in or even sometimes how much momentum you swing the car in, because there's so much bias of rear grip, the car will always return or, or, or catch itself from big angle. And so um, this gives us an opportunity to drift with more throttle uh, at a higher angle, at higher speeds, and still always recover it and save it. Okay, that's it. That's what we're going to do on this topic for now. Uh, if you've been hanging out with me, thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate that you, you stuck through the video. Um, just know that this is a really rudimentary and like low-level introduction to the floating pivot point and its bounding uh, dynamic box. Um, there's a bunch of topics that we didn't cover and haven't covered and probably won't cover in regards to getting into kingpin angles, rel like caster relative to camber, um, Ackerman. We can even get into varying like tire compounds. We can get into a bunch of, just a bunch of stuff of like toe curves versus uh, camber curves um, and it, it, it gets slow and fast rebounds of shocks there's a ton of things but thank you so much for hanging out and I hope this was helpful um, so yeah have a red time